from San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering Big Data SV 2016. Welcome back to theCUBE and uh, the Big Data Silicon Valley event. Uh, we've been live for the last couple of days and tonight we're having a we're being joined by a whole bunch of the members of our community to talk about some of these core big data issues. This segment, we're going to spend some time talking with some of the industry influencers, some of the leading analysts in the business. And I've been around analysts a lot, and this is uh, one of the best groups that I've ever been a part of assembling here. Uh, I want to introduce each of them in turn, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So Tony Bear of Ovum. Okay. I'm Tony Bear. I'm principal analyst with Ovum. And my coverage basically is data management, um, database management, and big data. And basically, the, you know, really the, the core, I guess, sort of theme of my coverage is looking at um, what will make big data a first-class citizen in the enterprise. Excellent. Mike Gualtieri of Forrester. Yeah, Mike Gualtieri, uh, Principal Analyst at Forrester. Uh, I generally cover advanced analytics and big data platforms. So I'm co-author on the predictive analytics wave, on the streaming analytics wave, on what we call the big data search and knowledge discovery wave, a few other waves, uh, the Hadoop, Hadoop waves as well. Um, so covering everything big data. You're one of Forrester's big surfers. And George Gilbert of Wikibon. Um, so my name is George Gilbert. Uh, I'm the chief uh, big data analyst at Wikibon. I, I like to say chief, but no in Indians. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm a techie by heart, and I like to cover how the technologies work, but I think what's ultimately more interesting is how we're going to apply them. And I think that you know having Peter here to help steer us with that kind of discipline is going to be a good, uh, a good experience for us. Well, George, you're still here, so I haven't driven you nuts <laughs> yet. So uh, you heard me talk about this evolving role of big data and uh, digital business. Uh, and I know, Tony, you, for example, talked about making digital or making data a first-class citizen. So I'll kick off some questions, and then uh, we'll open it up for everybody. I'll wander out into the audience and really, really frighten you. But Tony, why don't you talk a bit about what it means for data to become more of a first, uh, pr first class citizen within the enterprise? Right. Well, there are, it really goes on a couple levels. And part of it is really looking at fairly mundane you know, governance you know, level, which is that uh, basically uh, with big data, um, you need to know what data you know, is in your data lake. Um, and the thing is that you need to have the same type of confidence that the data that's in that data lake is as protected and, you know, and managed as it is in your enterprise databases. And so in the big data space, we basically started with a raw platform, and so we've really had to invent as we've gone along. We've, we've had, what we've found is that we've really had to adapt and extend governance. And so I think that's been a, a real key challenge for the big data community. But the other part, you know, which is really more in terms of what the advantage is and really where the, really where the, you know, the big payoff is, basically, is looking how data basically can, make a, you know, can basically make a competitive difference. And that's where I really see a really key role for machine learning, because it's really, you know, ultimately it's going to transform not just analytics, but applications, so that basically your supply chain application will have embedded analytics with embedded machine learning. You will not have to worry about having to program different machine learning algorithms, but it will make you smarter. And that's the type of thing that gets me very excited. Yeah, Mike, I was, uh, until recently, I was at Forrester with you and, uh, and got to know your research extremely well. And one of the advantages uh, that you bring to the table is great visibility both into the technology and many of these new business problems, what I call the problems of demand, uh, through some of Forrester's research about customers and how customers are evolving. Uh, why don't you identify, can you help identify yeah. a few of those key issues that are starting to percolate up? Yeah, so, so first I, I sort of use this framework. Uh, there's four types of insights that a business needs, strategic insights, right? Those are used to make decisions about should I build a new building here? Should I acquire this company? So there's strategic insights. Then there's KPI insights. You know, how is my business performing, right? And there's different time frames for these as well. And then there's operational insights. And then finally, there's real-time decisions, right? So there's sort of a spectrum. And across that spectrum, you need four types of analytics. You need descriptive analytics, which is more of your traditional BI. You need predictive analytics. And that's a little bit about what Tony was saying in terms of using a combination of statistical and machine learning algorithms to build predictive models. 
You need streaming analytics, which is all about what's happening in real time, think IoT. And then you need prescriptive analytics, which is, okay, what am I going to do? I predicted this outcome. What's the next best course of action? So what our research shows at Forrester is that the most focused insight that companies are looking for is that about the customer, right? Because if you can predict how the customer will behave, perhaps you can serve them better. And you can serve them better not tomorrow, but right now, right? Because the consumer is increasingly connected as well. So I, so I think what's behind um, big data and what's behind all of those companies on the exhibit floor is moving towards providing all those forms of analytics, but doing it cheaper, doing it faster, and especially using more advanced forms of analytics, not just reports that someone throws on the desk. And by the way, um, things like um, uh, visualization tools, which have been very hot, um, I, don't, I don't see those as particularly uh, as useful as other forms of analytics, because I think they're really flashy tools. But how many insights are really gained from those? I, you know, I, so I think companies <coughs> should, should refocus their efforts more on the advanced analytics more on the predictive modeling and prescriptive analytics. But increasingly in service to that fundamental question of engaging the customer. Yes. Yep. So George, uh, we've talked, you know, predictive analytics. I find it fascinating that we can almost look at the history of the industry if we look at it from the problems that we've solved. Right. Uh, the relationship between data and time, it's inextric inextricable. OLTP recorded what happened in the past. Yep. Uh, spreadsheets and a lot of uh, the, the you know, writing documents inside it was about telling people what's going to happen in the future and this real, real hard problem of what's happening right now. How do we compress the time to move data through the analysis chain to get to faster to that real-time notion? Okay, let me start with a, a user, usage scenario that I think might be relevant, which is Jeffrey Moore's done a great job of uh, popularizing the notion of systems of engagement, but he talks about it as a sort of a, a consumer uh, internet service provider class user experience tied into a traditional enterprise application. But it's when you start peeling away that um, the foundation that, need, that you need to build that, that you get to some of the answers to the questions you're, you're posing, which is for one, um, and following on Mike's comment, you can't anticipate and influence and guide the customer's interactions unless you have a machine learning model in the back, um, or at least a machine learning <coughs> model that's sort of snapshotted out a predictive model that says, here's how you should guide this customer. And um, then creating that model, in the past we had a database over here and a batch load over, you know, was it daily, weekly, whatever, to the data warehouse that might have, if it was very advanced, it would have cranked out a model. Um, and then the model would have gone back into the operational application. Now, we broke down the entire pipeline into a bunch of mix and match engines. And that's what the Hadoop, you know, that's the Hadoop analytic pipeline. And we thought it was the coolest thing since sliced bread because it was <laughs> 5 to 10% of the cost of, you know, your typical data warehouse appliance. Um, you had all this flexibility. You had incredible choice. And then we woke up one day and we realized we were in the same position we were with PCs when in the 90s Gartner did a study and found out that the a average annual cost of maintaining a PC was $6,000. And so this was, you know, with our big data pipelines, it was like the, that Verizon commercial where, you know, you have uh, 150 people behind, behind you, you know, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> and anyway, the, the shorter answer, or the end of the answer, is that um, um, we're, re we're, we're, we're revisiting simplicity with technologies like Spark. It doesn't replace Hadoop. It complements storage and management, and it replaces some of the analytic engines. It's not all totally mature, but I think there's a fair amount of agreement that it can deliver what, what we used to go to these mix and match engines for. And, and Peter, you know, you asked about sort of data as a first class citizen, right? And I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking, well, okay, it, it's really higher than that. It's analytics, but really it's predictive, right? So, so I like to think, what does it mean to be a predictive enterprise, right? 
where every decision you make, wouldn't it be good if you could have a certain probability, a better probability that, that what that decision was going to result in, even if that decision is about what to offer a customer um, or at the strategic level, what company to acquire. I think there's an opportunity to use that data to create predictive models. And I think once companies do that on all levels, they will become a predictive enterprise. And guess what? There already are predictive enterprises. It's called Google, it's called Facebook, it's called Amazon, right? Those are the companies that, that are truly predictive enterprises. They're using it across the board for everything. Yeah. And in many respects, it's almost the, the difference or the differentiation between uh, some of those time frames, the prediction versus the operations, yeah. is starting to blur. Yeah. That yeah. the mm -hmm. that the it's it's uh, the future is a series of operational steps yeah. that can be mapped out in advance. Well, there's another there's another concept that I I talk about a lot, which is called perishable insights. Right? There's many insights. It, it's perishable. You get it immediately. Right? There's some things where you get that insight. If you don't act on it, you're done. Right? It's really easy to think of you know uh, uh, some a stock trade or something. Right? But increasingly, as consumers are connected and your, your B2B uh, customers are connected, that, that window goes down, right? So how are you going to capture those perishable insights? So it's not just about throwing it into a data lake and doing that analytics. That's insufficient. You need that, but that's insufficient. You also need to do real-time analytics to capture and then act on those perishable and, insights. And, and the other thing is came up in one of the CUBE interviews, the notion of a, a today's perishable insight or this context perishable insight, like, oh, my heart rate's too high. Yeah. becomes <laughs> tomorrow's not so perishable insight when I have to go to a doctor because I'm yeah. sh had, you know, yeah. I work out so much. I mean, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> but I have to go to, <laughs> no, I, I, this is not my problem. I'm talking about a friend of mine. Um, but I have to go to a doctor and actually uh, that data now becomes not so perishable. Mm -hmm. In a new context, mm -hmm. it, be it takes on a new role right. and a new source of value. Right. Tony? Well, there's another way of thinking about it, which is really breaking down the, you know, the barrier between basically transactional application and analytics, and that traditionally we did transactions and analytics we did after the fact to figure out how we could do transactions better the next time. What we're, what we're finding out now is basically through the, uh, the, you know, through the advances in hardware with you know, in-memory processing, this can now be done fast enough. And in fact, basically at the speed of today's business where you're trying to give, you know, basically, you know, let's say a next best offer, you're trying to engage a gamer, you're trying to basically, uh, you know, you know, basically you know, uh, stop some, mal you know, some, some intrusion in real time, you know, you know, integrating analytics with the transaction is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Right. So do we have any questions from the audience? Is anybody, so we got one, so let me, let me see if I can... Uh, take my incredibly fit self. And uh, we got a microphone here? Yes, there it is, Lawrence. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, say who you are, please. I am Phil Hotston. I'm with uh, Sama Technologies. So a new buzzword that I heard today with a meeting with a customer, um, this is from Mike, uh, I'm towards you. A new buzzword that I heard today from a, a client that I was working with um, talks about building not just a data lake, but an intelligent data lake. Can you tell <laughs> me which, where you think that trend is going? Thanks. Well, I think it's going to go to an advanced intelligent data lake. <laughs> <laughs> and it should be predictive as well. Yeah. yeah. Autonomous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, I, yeah, so I, I mean, I, th I haven't heard this, but I think what what they're probably referring to is like the first notion of a data lake is that we just have silos. You know, we have, we have a portfolio of hundreds of applications and the data is just everywhere. We have some of it in a data warehouse, but the data warehouse itself has become a silo. So let's just get it all together in a data lake. No intelligence. The intelligence is that now we finally have the data together. So now we can do some more sophisticated anal analysis. The intelligent data lake could mean, and I don't know what they're referring to, but could mean we're seeing some companies now adding continuous analytics on that data lake, right? Starting to do machine learning to build models in that data lake, not using the data lake simply as a repository, uh, as sort of a, a landing zone for data that is then pushed up to a data warehouse or to another platform analysis, but actually continuous analytics. And if you look at, um, an example of this, uh, Google, um, Google Dataflow, which is their, it's sort of their real-time batch slash um, uh, streaming platform in one. Um, that's really that technical approach um, that, I, that I would say is probably similar uh, to a intelligent data lake. Another question? 
James? <coughs> Say who you are. Yeah, I'm James. Hello? Is, this on? Is it on, guys? Hello? Sorry. Did I turn it off? And James Kabilos with IBM. Um, I'm also a former Forrester analyst, but it's, it's a material here. Um, the, the notion of perishable insights was, was really interesting. Um, you know, in many ways you can look at those as they're, they're perishable in the sense that they may be very short-lived in terms of windows, but they may encode very important response loops to things that might happen in the future. And that's algorithms, essentially. Um, so I'd like to see, I'd like to hear what the panel's thought is in terms of how do you, you know, in terms of governance, um, you know, there's data governance that you should be doing in your data lake. Uh, the, but how should you be doing algorithm governance or model governance so you can <laughs> preserve those perishable insights algorithmically so that they can be used in the future when those particular scenarios present themselves, how can you make those kinds of perishable insights discoverable in the future when somebody's building the, another next best action application that requires those kinds of you know, assets? Yeah, it's a good question, Jim, because you know, using a, a real-time or streaming analytics platform, it doesn't magically ingest data and figure out what to do, right? And, and this is why it's also important to have a batch uh, processing regime as well, right? So, so you're gathering all of this data, you're building models, and once you're confident with that model, then you can inject it in the, in the streaming engine uh, to detect those. But it's a continuous process, right? Because models are based upon correlation, not causation, right? So they can go out of whack, right? So, so you have to continuously update and monitor those. But you asked another question too, which, is, which I thought you were asking about how do you trust the algorithm? This is a big problem as well, right? Because some of these algorithms that are just running, a business executive has to make a decision. A data scientist says, here, I found the perfect model. That model could have implications uh, of millions of dollars if it's wrong. And, and there's techniques that, that companies use to overcome that. I mean, Amazon, for example, is constantly testing models. They'll do an A-B test, or, or sometimes it's known as a champion challenger for those models. But, but there's also a big issue. As more models are used, how can we trust those models uh, from a business perspective. I think Tony, another I'm, issue there, though, is yeah. also like, are we using the right data set? Are we, getting, are we looking yeah. for the is right signals? So it's really both models and, yeah. data, and data sets. Yeah. And I would add that there's sort of like a, a third derivative, um, Jim, which is that uh, as we get to in, in that uh, S-curve chart, when we're up and to the right where we have sort of intelligent self-tuning systems, you never really take the, the data scientist or the human out of the loop but you can apply machine learning to the um, analytic pipeline more and more. So it might, um, it might evaluate new data sets to see if they are valid predictors or, or if, if really if they have um, a positive correlation, if they add to the uh, fidelity of the model. And, um, and you can even go far, so far as to have them benchmark a model against um, an existing one and to keep to keep the uh, essentially the exi existing one from drifting, so I, I guess what I'm saying is there's there's a, a runtime one which is the one we're all familiar with, and then there's a design time one that will come you know we'll see in several several years out. out. Yeah, just one thing to add to that, which is that what's really essential is to have. I mean, well, it, it almost sounds cliche, but you need a good, effective collaboration environment. So we're basically, we're, you know, people have insights, let's say, on different data sets or in specific models or algorithms or know what to apply in certain scenarios, uh, your domain experts or whatever. You need to have some sort of way of sharing that. And eventually, over time, you build up, I mean, like, I don't want to sound like, a, you know, basically like I'm trying to um, promote, like, a knowledge management system. You know, I mean, that, you know, but you need something very dynamic, and maybe there's kind of like a Yelp rating system or whatever. I mean, that's the type of thing which hopefully the community will start to kind of figure out. But we need collaboration and to pool our collective intelligence. And the one thing I'd add to that, uh, James, I'm going to move on. The one thing I'd add to that is, uh, very quickly, is that, uh, it is easier to govern hardware and software than it is to gather, govern human beings. Mm -hmm. And so the, the other thing we haven't mentioned is that as this machine learning, as its system does more self-tuning, we can translate policy directly into software, and that's going to have an enormous implication how things run. One more.
Okay. Who are you? Um, my name That's is a Sharon really Clark. good I'm question. Independent consultant. <laughs> um, on a related point, I have a question. As you move to real time, how do you uh, see companies dealing with um, data quality? You know, I, I, as a consultant, I always talk about it as the Mickey Mouse problem. Like almost every company has Mickey Mouse as a customer in their data set somewhere. <laughs> it's a really good question with regard to data quality. Um, and the thing is that what we've, you know, through our research at Ovum, we've really sort of, and I realize that what you're talking about is, is a, sort of a slightly different use case, but there's your traditional analytics where you're making some hard and fast decisions that must be audible, and therefore that data has to be as watertight as possible. You need data that where you have, let's say, just for you know, arbitrary sake, say a 90% confidence rating. Then you're doing the exploratory, where you're basically trying to figure out well, what's the right data to look at, what's the right problem, what right question to ask, and there basically, you know, if let's say you've, you know, if you uh, if your data set is not totally complete, you maybe you've missed, you know, some some click streams or some tweet streams or whatever, it's not, you know, it's not a showstopper. That being said, basically, when you know when you're dealing with you know a you know, real-time stream. You need to know the provenance of that stream, the, you know, the provenance of the source, I should say, and take that into account in terms of whatever decisions you're making you know, on that stream. All right, so I want to thank uh, our panelists, uh, Tony, Mike, George. Great to see you guys again. You. And uh, we're going to reconfigure the stage and bring up some customers and talk about uh, how the doers are getting things done. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.